Hi there, and welcome to another interview. Today, I've got the fabulous Frankie with me, and I'm going to ask her the question, ask absolutely every guest, and that's, hey, Frankie, why did you become carnivore? I became carnivore basically because it was the first time in my life that I felt freedom. Um, and it's been a very long road to carnivore. I was born with a rare thyroid abnormality, so it's partially formed. Um, and I've got some ectopic tissue that kind of floats around in my neck, um, occasionally decides the, to join the party and produce some of its own thyroid hormone. So as you can imagine, the management of this condition has been quite a challenge over the years. And I, I started my career in education. So I was working with children from, you know, when I left school, I, I started working with little ones and found that I got trapped in the, it was such a lovely environment. I got trapped in the kind of downward spiral of processed food very quickly. Um, and that, you know, that happened even at school. I, before, you know, before I was working, I found that managing this was increasingly difficult but I would have food triggers that I would completely ignore so I was going through all of these hormonal changes particularly at high school and food food cravings were uncontrollable um I had next to no energy I was trying to sort of get myself up in the morning I distinctly remember my dad used to throw buckets of water at me when at his most desperate he would throw buckets of water over me to try and get me up in the morning for school um and exhaustion and um fatigue all of these uh, kind of unbalanced energy level levels basically um are, are one of the main symptoms when you're looking at thyroid conditions um so that was that was really hard but i felt all the peer pressure and i certainly didn't connect the dots enough in my younger years when it came to what power food had to control my thyroid um so like I say yeah I got trapped in the kind of binge and restrict yo-yo diets um very much tried the kind of low fat approach and calorie counting um all of these things and I would basically have most of my week at school where I would restrict like mad and sort of try and not really get anything for lunch, go all day pretty much without food. And then I would have this giant evening meal that was usually pretty rubbish. <laughs> um, I would stay, uh, my parents were separated when I was very young. So I would stay half the week with my dad and half with my mum. And my dad was a typical bachelor only really knew how to cook three or four meals. It was all beige food. <laughs> um, and my mum was the opposite. So she was born in India, raised me on completely, you know, uh, home cooked meals, very real food, um, still quite plant based. But we had meat, definitely. Um, and everything was sourced very well. She would replace cleaning products with essential oils because she was into aromatherapy um so I had these two kind of quite stark contrasts in what I was getting throughout the week but this theme of just having this really large almost binge worthy evening meal remained a thing and and was the basis of quite an unhealthy relationship with food um and then I worked sort of I went into my working years and um, again there was kind of a culture that us nursery workers were a bit like a family but we would order in these like giant baguettes and pastries and all of these things at lunch breaks and and my weight piled on it was yeah I piled the weight on very 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 quickly and I was miserable um, there were so many different symptoms that I was battling with a thyroid condition, hair loss, dry skin, um, just the energy levels, like I was saying, were plummeting. Um, and then I 
turn things around very quickly between kind of working with children and then actually having my own child so I fell pregnant with my daughter and um it was just that point and I think lots of mothers feel like this it was a point where I really wanted to prioritize my health more than ever before because you know you're you're holding a, a precious baby inside you you're now responsible for the health of your growing baby um so this kind of passion grew inside me and I was reading loads and loads of books becoming more and more switched on about thyroid conditions and actually it's so easy to get lost in this trap of believing you know that it's just this number that the doctors will throw at you you just have to look at the TSH um your only option for treatment is a t4 only in the uk it's levothyroxine that's what you are given and there, there is no talk of anything else um and so i become i became aware of you know the full thyroid panel of tests um what other treatment options there were and how to manage my condition with food um and the first thing I did was cut out sugar and gluten. And that was huge in itself. That was a massive turning point for me. Um, my energy increased. Uh, I think I, I reduced the amount of thyroxine that I was taking uh, quite quickly. My weight became more manageable. Um, I had quite a battle throughout pregnancy. Um, I, I still believe that my thyroid had a lot to do with that and I was nowhere near where I am now health-wise when I had my first baby so um and that's what I try and you know I try and teach people now is so important to get your hormones balanced and really address hormonal health um and certainly don't go meat free <laughs> when you're embarking on a pregnancy because it is so so detrimental um so anyway things then sort of progressed very quickly i i lost my gallbladder um as some people might be aware thyroid conditions uh, increase your risk for gallbladder complications and um upon a scan mine was like a shingle beach um that's what it was described to me as if I'd have known what I know now, I certainly wouldn't have given up my gallbladder and just said, yeah, OK, take it out. <laughs> if anyone tells you that you can live without an organ, you know, just like you were before, just, you know, don't believe <laughs> don't believe them because that is entirely untrue. Um, and there are many ways that you can manage um, gallbladder problems before actually giving up the organ. So, yes. So I, that happened. I then moved more into a ketogenic way of eating and I through watching lots of YouTube videos and embarking on pretty much the start of my education in nutrition um I came across Dr Eric Berg like many people do that's usually the first name to appear and um I went down the rabbit hole completely I lost four stone um things balanced like never before using uh, a ketogenic style diet um, and I did pair that with intermittent fasting at the time um, I again now I've I've learned many many lessons which um, have have taught me that's that's not necessarily the correct thing to do especially for ladies um, and the prolonged ketosis for particularly thyroid conditions can be again a little bit uh of a of a tricky one it's not great for everybody to remain in in ketosis for quite so long um but i i became very determined and my hunger for learning about nutrition i you know i was i became just this bookworm i was constantly reading constantly watching youtube videos trying to i was reading you know uh, medical papers even just wanted to find out more and more and more and I was talking to everybody anybody that would engage in a conversation with me I was talking to them about food and lifestyle for you know 
just adding years onto your life and controlling these diseases that plague us. So that was very much the start of my journey. And from there, it's, it, it's just grown. I continued to work with children for a few years. And actually my last, um, my last setting that I worked in in education was with boys with special educational needs. A lot of them had um, ADHD, autism, and a number of behavioral issues that went along with that. And I was having sort of little sideline conversations with some of the parents, which at the time I probably shouldn't have been doing. But the ones that listened to me, there was profound changes. So some of these boys couldn't sit through 10 minutes of a lesson, um, you know, before chairs were being flipped over, staff were assaulted daily. This, you know, it was quite an intense environment. And my heart went out to them because I could see that actually a lot of this was food driven and, and lifestyle driven. There was, you know, lack of sleep coming in that all of them had pretty processed high sugar diets. They were gaming, you know, into the early hours of the morning, which again, just exaggerated these issues. So I would have these nice little conversations and the parents that implemented some of the things that I was suggesting, you know, starting with just eliminating sugar and gluten and removing temptation from the family home. Um, I would give them little tips for nav navigating the supermarket and what to do if there were these massive tantrums that, you know, are really, really difficult and stressful for parents, especially parents of children with special needs. Um, and there was amazing changes. I mean, boys that would just not even engage in a conversation were having full forward back, you know, conversations with me and sitting through 15, 20 minutes of a lesson engaging rather than, you know, being disruptive and reciting spellings, which was absolutely miraculous. Um, and that was just the tip of the iceberg, really, just encouraging a bit more sleep and cutting these two sort of big triggers out of the out of the picture in terms of food um but I have to say at this point because your question your original question was obviously why did you go carnivore and I was feeling an immense pressure I I've always been all or nothing. I've always been very kind of, I want it now once I started reading and knowing what was possible. I, you know, this switch kind of flicked in my head where I was very determined, very disciplined, um, and I still am. But being in ketosis and tracking carbs and, you know, tracking my sleep, weighing, measuring everything, doing fasted workouts and being so disciplined with movement as well really really took its toll on me and this is what I try and speak about probably very quickly when I consult with people now is there should be a freedom to this that you have never felt before when you're doing things right it does feel freeing that is you know as humans we have moved so far away from what's ancestrally appropriate for us. And, you know, what humans have been doing for generations, you know, waking up with sunlight exposure, optimizing your circadian rhythm with the simplest of things, um, looking at environmental toxins, eating real food, it, all of these things just have completely disappeared from our, from our, our daily routines. And, so I try to get people back to that and I'll I'll introduce myself by saying that, you know, I am I'm a nutrition consultant, but I specialize in making things simple. And hopefully that will bring so much more consistency. And that's what I that's what brought me to Carnivore. I watched one video between Dr. Anthony Chafee and um oh the lovely lady who eats lots of burger patties <laughs> oh, kelly hogan i'm sorry kelly um she 
her, their interview was fantastic and it just it just was sort of like a light bulb moment for me when I just thought yeah I should not be punishing myself uh, like this it shouldn't feel you know I've, I've got all the rewards feeling healthy bringing my thyroid back into balance um sort of sort of um again I still didn't know what was possible the difference between having you know eating a ketogenic diet and moving into carnivore was again like night and day in terms of thyroid function um and now I know why um and to not have to sort of fast so aggressively aggressively to keep my weight stable um and I've also you know optimized things even further by really making things work for my cycle I think men and women should sort of approach carnival slightly differently um we can talk a bit about that if you want to um but yeah my own journey has taught me so much but carnival is has just been the most freeing um wonderful experience and I cannot see myself going back really <laughs> um so yeah hopefully that's answered your question I don't think I've left any holes there <laughs> Yeah, no, that's fantastic. That's exactly what I want. Um, just so people know, I met Frankie at the Public Health Collaboration in Sheffield, the conference there, and couldn't wait to get her on. So her story is pretty new to me. And I deliberately said before we started recording, don't tell me anything, because I, I want to hear and then give some real uh, feedback or some get some real questions. So um, to those people that were listening and taking notes, I did take notes and I'm going to pick up on a few things because I think it's really interesting. And if you're all right, Frankie, we'll just go through what you just said. And I've got a few little points that I want to just clarify. One thing, which is a dramatic image, is having water thrown over to, to wake you up. So do you think that is primarily the thyroid issue that was making you unable to wake up? Yes. Um, yeah. It's a very unmanaged thyroid condition. Um, and because I've got half the thyroid gland, um, but yet I was treated as if I had the autoimmune condition Hashimoto's, um, you know, and that's what the medical system tends to do is treat everybody like they've got Hashimoto's because to them it doesn't really matter what your root cause is. Um, we know that actually that's extremely important in order to get treatment correct. And, you know, um, the root cause has to be looked at. And often that can be, if it is autoimmune, you can completely reverse that. But for me, um, I was, yeah, I was looking at quite a different picture. And it took me many years to find out that that was what I was dealing with, that actually my thyroid was never going to perform like somebody else's because, I had half the gland there, so it wasn't, you know, it just didn't have the, the capability of kicking out the full amount of thyroid hormone that I needed. So, so yeah. Is there an official name to your condition? Um, so congenital hyperthyroidism is what it's known as. So when you have uh, either, some people can actually be born without a thyroid. It's very rare. But um, yes, that would be the name. Anything that happens in pregnancy um, or, you know, when the when you're growing in the womb, that's the, the name given to it usually. Yeah, I'm just going to go on a little tangent just for people watching. And food can also affect the thyroid. And um, people that find that difficult to believe, for instance, there are zoos around the world which have signs now say, saying do not feed the animals fruit because some of the animals are getting diabetic. And, and uh, the, the, the disability the, or the, the lack of being able to get up, actually, Prague Zoo has a very interesting video of one of their baby elephants and the mother elephant cannot wake the baby up and, and actually goes off to get the keeper. The keeper has to physically get this baby elephant up because um, they have difficulty getting up. So, uh, you know, it, I don't think it's an unusual thing, Frankie, for, for, for people with thyroid conditions to have low energy. And I think um, it's just a very dramatic image of uh, your, your father coming in with a bucket of water to wake you up. You know, it's a bit like a sitcom, but I absolutely... <laughs> 
know people that do tell me their energy is absolutely tanked because of their thyroid yeah. and, and, and this so, way of eating changes it so much yes exactly and so when i say um it was unmanaged i think that is it's very much to do with what i was consuming as well so when i say it's it was all because of my thyroid condition you know it i think actually that was a blessing in disguise because had I not been experiencing all those things maybe I wouldn't have steered at um, looking at at what I was consuming and and all of these lifestyle factors that I've now come to understand but yes definitely like you say I think I was triggering worse symptoms and more of a exhaustion and difficulty waking in the morning because of um, how I was treating my body at the time. Yeah, and a, and a bit of an abstract question for you, but I think it will also ha- help paint a picture of your preferences um, because it's a fascinating experiment. Um, half of the week your dad did beige food and half of the week your mum cooked whole food and home-cooked yeah. food. So what did you prefer? Um, I definitely, I, I preferred my mum's cooking um, and that was always... And I always noticed that I would feel better. I wouldn't have, you know, you notice that it was my dad that would throw the water over me to get me up in the morning and be a bit sort of, you know, he had a military background. So he was a little bit of a, you know, uh, why are you not just getting up on time and everything? It must be in a timely fashion. But um, I didn't have the extremes of that at my mum's when I was eating primarily kind of very um it was very whole foods it was more times than not Indian cuisine because that's um how she was raised and my my grandma and my mum were just absolutely amazing at cooking um sort of traditional Indian food um so it was lots of spices lots of fresh herbs um and there wasn't a processed packet what I now call packets and promises, they were nowhere to be seen at my mum's house. Um, And then the additional bit to that was that she already knew from her teenage years about environmental toxins and was, um, you know, practising what she preached in, in that fashion in our family home. She would absolutely wince at the thought of having a chemically, you know, filled uh cleaning cabinet or something so yeah yeah. i mean it's just fascinating as an experiment that because many people might think oh i bet she preferred the processed food and uh, and all that but obviously i think once you're exposed to home cooked food and whole foods it is delicious and actually more enjoyable and gives you more energy so i think that was really good Uh, uh, so one thing that made my ears prick up was uh you became aware of the full thyroid panel. Now, that's a great phrase. As a qualified phlebotomist, it makes me very happy to hear that. Um, do you want to tell the viewers what you view is the thi- thyroid panel, the full thyroid panel? Yes. So TSH is always thrown in there, and I don't completely disregard it as being important, but it's useless without T4, T3, reverse T3, which people still don't you know you think you're getting a full thyroid panel and reverse t3 is still not on there uh thyroid antibodies i like to look at electrolytes as part of that and iron as well because iron stores have a huge connection to the thyroid's performance that's brilliant so, that's yeah. brilliant. I mean, I have a video on this channel which goes through the full thyroid panel. And the antibodies are often missed, TPO and TG. You're right there to do that. Um, I often also recommend selenium just as uh, just to get that out of the way in case there's a selenium uh, yes. deficiency. And I, yeah, completely agree with that. And so people go crazy with supplementing with iodine and selenium. And actually, you know, I found the best way if you're going to supplement with anything is the oyster extract because you get this beautiful harmony between zinc, selenium and iodine in a food source, which doesn't pose any risks with sort of one getting out of whack with the other, which, again, is just it can leave people feeling lousy if selenium and iodine aren't actually being supplemented in the correct dosing. So, uh, you, you know. 
you're probably well, well aware of all of this, but yes, it's... Um, yeah, I am, but not everybody watching is. You see, this, no, this is, exactly. <laughs> I mean, the idea is to have a sort of to and throw. And um, you see, the, the beauty of letting you speak is so many things come up organically and then we can just pick back on it and then move forward. Um because I wouldn't have asked this question or at least pointed this out, but you did cutting out, you said cutting out sugar and gluten made a huge difference. Now, many people might think that, well, this is as good as it gets because they've had years of feeling lousy and these simple cutting out sugar and gluten is going to make them feel better. Um, you know, and to the point where it, you know, you said a huge difference and I want people watching who are maybe not a hundred percent into going over to carnivore. I totally get, that because when i went low carb i thought wow this is brilliant this this is great mm. and then when i went keto i thought oh this is even better but i still was open-minded and i made that leap to carnivore so i think um i hear this about 30 30 percent of my interviews people say oh i cut out gluten made a huge difference mm. so um if you're out there and thinking well i don't need to go carnivore because I am feeling great on keto. Or I am feeling great with the odd slice of bread and stuff like that. You just don't know how good you can feel until you do it. Um, yeah. it's, it's brilliant. But then we're going to get to a contentious is issue now. I'm just going to praise you a little bit more of what you said. You know, you lost your gallbladder. Knowing then what you know now, wow, is that my phrase? <laughs> is that everybody's phrase in carnival? You yeah. would not give up an organ. Uh, I've got this in the family where people have, uh, not got gallbladders and subsequent problems with, uh, you know, digesting fat. Eric Berg was my <laughs> gateway, by the way. But I love, I'm, I'm getting to the bit I want to talk about. You then mentioned keto and inter, uh, intermittent fasting, but you've learned so much. And maybe sometimes being in ketosis is, is not a good thing to be in it long term. So could you just expand on why you think that? So I noticed that I noticed some symptoms start to return um when I was on keto it took it took a number of years for me to get so in tune with my body that I really realized what was happening and so people can just spend so much time in ketosis and for men this might not be quite as much of an issue or or it might just take a bit longer to rear its ugly head um because obviously Dr Eric Berg has been singing the praises of keto and fasting together for many many years and is you know still feeling quite all right so that will be the argument for many people I think but particularly when you're dealing with thyroid conditions the prolonged ketosis really can affect your t3 levels it can and I've had that on you know that has shown itself to be true with my labs being taken um having the knowledge of what I really need needed to be looking at is hugely powerful and so this is what I try and tell people is you must take your health into your own hands by having the knowledge of what thyroid tests you need and how to how to read them um, because you will be able to evidence these symptoms and feelings with some kind of tangible results as well um, but yes, what I was noticing is that my thyroid medication was creeping up again on keto and my hormones were definitely affected. So I had a Dutch panel done um, a, a long time ago now, several months back, and um, it was highlighted that I had chronically high cortisol, low progesterone, um, and my my thyroid just wasn't where it should be. My reverse T3 um, to T3 ratio was not ideal at all. Um, and for anybody that doesn't think reverse T3 is important, I just want to sort of explain a little bit about what that is. So reverse T3 is almost like the opposite of T3. So T3 is your active thyroid hormone, the thing that gives you the kind of get up and go, the va va boom, the, you know, gives you your vitality back and, um, you know, gets all these things, these mechanisms working again in your body. Um, reverse T3 is sort of like the storage version of T3 and can start to make you feel some of these thyroid 
uh, sort of underactive thyroid symptoms again. And there are also other things that can crop up. So if your gut health is not on point or your liver health is not on point, you can compromise the conversion from inactive T4 to active T3 thyroid hormones. So there could have been a bit of that going on as well. I think that having lots and lots of plants in my diet, I, you know, even through my education, probably much like you, it was like eat the rainbow, promote a hugely diverse gut microbiome. You know, that's where you're going to feel your best. Fill your fill your plate with fiber. That will slow down the, you know, um, the sugar spike and everything. And I fell for it hook, line and sinker. And I so my plates were regularly this hugely colourful, like beautiful salads. I was a salad photographer. I was like, look at my beautiful, nutritious plates of foods. And I I was still having gas and bloating and all of these issues. So I think, you know, I had a way to go in terms of gut health, but also the prolonged ketosis was not... Um, was not serving me as somebody that had th- uh, uh, half a thyroid and um, a chronically high cortisol was probably a lot to do with trying to train too much and not looking at um, a lot of other things that were part of my lifestyle when I was in uh, sort of following a keto plan. So um, that has completely turned around when um, on carnival and you I describe to people this beautiful ebb and flow that you just go in, in and out of ketosis according to your hunger signals and the amount of protein that you consume, which is the most beautifully natural way for your body to work. So, yeah. Yeah, There's there's a lot in that answer. I'm not going to unpack it all because I didn't take any notes. I was just sitting back and listening absolutely brilliant Frankie that's really good I mean if you if if anyone's listening to the sort of uh talk and thinking well what's wrong with salads what's wrong with uh doing all this sort of thing you've got to remember your thyroid needs raw materials to make stuff it's really really that simple the mm-hmm. gallbladder needs you to ingest fat so it can release some of the bile you need to be able to make bile by having plenty of cholesterol and other cofactors and when yeah. you're on a plant-based diet you've got the added problem of plant sterols which which are taking over the cholesterol from animals so anyway uh, i don't want to get too sciencey because um, if you want to know about the reverse T3, like I say, the video I've done about the panel, the full thyroid panel, does actually have the molecular structure of T3 and reverse T3. So people can see it's a real thing. And the reason I'm just banging that home, Frank, is because from the phlebotomy side of things, there are still still healthcare professionals out there who don't even believe there is such a thing as reverse T3, yeah. even though we can see its molecular structure. So um, and if just, you're getting... to, just to say on that, I fully, if you have a thyroid condition and you are left feeling desperate, my heart goes out to you because only last year at the age of 35, have I seen a thyroid specialist within the NHS. So there's me, obviously, I the last time I saw a specialist, I was 10 years old and the whole thing is a little bit of a blur. But between you know, 10 and 20 and 35, I've had to manage this pretty much alone. Um, and like you say, even the specialist that I've seen most recently, it was a flat out argument to basically educate her on why the full thyroid panel is important. And, you know, what, how many different processes within the body rely on your thyroid working efficiently? You know, the the connection the thyroid has to your sex hormones, to your your adrenal glands. A lot of people, again, within mainstream don't believe that adrenal fatigue is a thing, you know. And okay, if you don't want to call it adrenal fatigue, you can call it adrenal insufficiency. If that's, (laughs) you know, that fits your medical diary a little bit better. But um, these things are, are very real and your body really does rely on on your thyroid working yeah and it's it's common sense isn't it if you've got an organ you've got a gland or you've got anything producing something and you push it too much or you don't give it the raw materials there's going to be a problem 
I mean, yeah. adrenals, if you, you know, people, people do know the phrase like burnt out, stressed out, you know, um, well, you, you can see that somebody can go to a certain level of stress and then completely change and become incredibly fatigued as opposed to being hyper and, yeah. and on it and, you know, very obviously stressed. And it yeah. isn't the yeah. fact that they suddenly mellowed. It's because they've overworked their adrenals. I mean, it's it's just common sense. And I I think the thing you said about the arguments with healthcare professionals, uh, that I could do an hour and a half with you probably just talking about that. Um, (laughs) I mean, even the simple thing that thyroid stimulating hormone is not a thyroid hormone, but a pituitary gland one is an argument I've had. So um, let's not get into that. I don't like to be too negative. (laughs) We're just trying to educate people, just give you the information, do your own research. But I would say I do want to bang home that if you have problems with your thyroid, you have to fight tooth and nail to get a full thyroid panel and you shouldn't have to be justifying it. And if you if if you want to know about your autoimmune condition, getting the TPO and TG antibodies is really critical because you can have empirical data to go back and and say, look, it's got better. You can actually prove it gets better by not only your presentation of symptoms or your lack of presentation of symptoms but also with some numbers and and people might wake up the more you push you're in the right okay it's your body you've done your research they um are sitting in there just basically trying to do a prescription pad answer that's it sorry it's not a lifestyle answer very often it's just trying to get you on a simple path where they tick some boxes and then give you a tablet or some sort of um, supplement and it isn't about that really so that's great um you also touched on the word freedom i was big on this i I talked about this till i I made everybody fall asleep with boredom because i had food freedom i think for the first time last may all right four years carnival now but three years into it i really suddenly felt wow i don't think about food all the time this is amazing Mm -hmm. And I know you weren't talking about just food freedom, but but it is a freedom in your life, isn't it? That's that's the thing where you're not regimented. You're not thinking I've got to have breakfast, lunch, dinner. I give my little example of freedom is I used to wake up before I before I went low carb and I was absolutely convinced that I had to have breakfast before I went out. Had to. Simple as that. Even even, you know, I was a little bit overweight. I was active, personal trainer, didn't smoke, didn't drink. I did all the, you know, the guidelines. And I now realize that was complete rubbish, absolute mm-hmm. rubbish. And, and working out, I thought, oh, I've got to eat two hours before and I've got to have protein an hour and a half later. All of these things seem like little niggly bits. But actually, when you're not doing those things, you realize how tied down you were to absolute um, nonsensical way of thinking. So yeah. what what could you expand on what you mean by f- total freedom? So I was kind of the opposite of that in terms of I was still unbeknown to me fe- sort of quite restricted and that mentality stuck with me probably from very very early days of yo-yo diets and all of these things I was doing it it came probably qu- an unnaturally easy to do something that lots of people find very, very hard. So that was counting the carbohydrates I was eating and tracking my macros um, and, you know, training fasted every single day. All of these things I was just doing without a second thought, but at the same time, it was really taking its toll. Um, And I would spend probably good 40 minutes maybe at the end of the day making sure that I put everything down in my little life sum app um and I hadn't gone over my carbohydrates and you know if I had gone over by something I would be trying to do another few press-ups to counteract it and it was just not a way to live at all and you know I yes I I was at that point I was still qualified in nutrition and I was consulting with people and telling people you know how to to do some of these things and now I look back thinking no I don't want any of my clients ever to feel like they have to count track way you know counteract their calorie consumption with exercise any of these unhealthy 
things. It just creates such a disastrous relationship with food and leaves you burnt out and with numerous hormone imbalances. Um, so by total food freedom, I literally mean if I wake up and I'm hungry and I want breakfast, I'm not going to try and fast till 10 o'clock just because that's my eating window. I'm going to get up and I'm going to eat something. Um, and now, you know, it might seem like restriction to lots of people to just stick with animal based foods. But to me, it's like, well, no, because I can eat as much as I want of these foods to to a point and not think about it I'm not tracking anything I'm not weighing or measuring I'm not um I know how to eat for my cycle which is again another thing that I think is so super important for ladies um people can get extremely bogged down in the should I be high fat should I be high protein should I you know do all these things even within the walls of a carnivore diet and it's like actually I think there are times for both especially for ladies I think there are times for high fat there's times for high protein there are times to exercise with more intensity and there's times to back off a bit and do a little bit of you know steady state cardio yoga um just breath work if that's all you feel like um yeah I think you're talking about the difference sorry I interrupted there. Go on. No, no, I'm. I've probably steered away from your initial question, but no, I, um, I just want to pick up on the fact you said it made a difference to your cycle, and you've got clients. So you run a particular program, don't you? Yes. So uh, it's starting on the second of July, um, and this is something I'm extremely passionate about because it just comprises everything everything that I want to deliver to people. So one of the first things I wanted to try and break when I embarked on sort of running my own business in nutrition was breaking the stigma that healthy health was for the rich. Living a healthy lifestyle was only for the wealthy and the affluent. And, you know, you can never have a nutritionist to guide you or, you know, get the right blood tests or look at these things um if you are not you you know you don't have the bank balance to support it um but also a common theme that started to run through my consultations was that men and women needed to do things a little bit differently that families if families didn't get on board with all of this together people were up against some serious roadblocks and actually it was the difference between someone creating a lifestyle or not and falling back into you know the traps of processed food and all of these things eating for convenience and speed and you know oh you know I don't want to cook three or four different meals for the family of course you don't that is a complete ball ache I'm not going to want anybody to be cooking you know I've got two children it's just become a no I'm not going to cook you something different and you something different and it's exhausting as a mother or father trying to accommodate that kind of routine so this program is for everyone I am literally I'm charging the same amount or less than I would for one consultation and so it's me for eight weeks doing carnivore with you for you know and then it's just one price for as many people as can fit on the screen as possible (laughs) Um, and I'm going to talk about everything so why men and women should do it differently how you can support each other as husband and wife or girlfriend and boyfriend um, what different things you can do as uh, you know as addressing a lifestyle not just a fad diet Um, yeah and and look at absolutely everything that should um, be comprised into into a carnivore lifestyle and and doing it together basically um and then obviously we're going to have some wonderful people join us like you and dr chafee and i've got um dr rachel brown um and several others that are just going to come and speak and share their knowledge and um i think even uh, dr chafee's lovely partner l is going to come and talk with him so that again we can see how this works as a partnership so yeah i mean he's uh 
I mean, Rachel Brown is particularly good as well. And uh, but I would have yeah. to say Anthony Chafee is such a supporter of other people. It's incredible. I mean, I take my hat off to him because his uh, knowledge is is fantastic. But the effort he puts in and the time he puts in is really good. Um, yeah. There will be links in the description, by the way for people to find out about that program that starts 2nd of July. Obviously, this video is evergreen. If it's um, now 2029 when you're watching this, that happened years <laughs> ago. But anyway, <laughs> um, this will be out well before the 2nd of July 2023. Um, but of course, there will be links to Frankie's social media and any other links that we need to um, if you want to get a hold of her because you've liked what she said. I, I like to keep my interviews sh short and sweet. Every time at the end, I always want to say we could do another hour of this, but I'm going to ask you on screen if you come back once you start the program to give us a little bit of an update of how it's going. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. That'd be great. Um, if someone is watching this and they're on the fence, I'm going to change the question. I normally ask if they're on the fence about carnival, what would you do? to um what tip would you give them but i'm going to actually say this this is a different question so it's an original question for you if someone's on the fence about whether they've got a thyroid problem or not um what would you think would be the best bit of advice for them so well, that's a very good question um because lots of people do remain on the fence thinking what is this is it you know is it that i've overdone the fasting or you know it could be many many things because symptoms run so far and wide when it comes to thyroid um, imbalances but i would just encourage you to get some support join a, a group there's a, an amazing um platform um online which is run by the same person i believe that created the book stop the thyroid madness um and there's many there's so many online platforms that have communities which um, discuss thyroid conditions and actually can pinpoint certain clinics near to you as well that will offer the full thyroid panel. So I just my biggest tip is get educated, um, really, really do your own research and don't just put anything on the back burner. If you're dealing with a a hormone imbalance um, or, you know, symptoms that sound like they could match a thyroid condition, please don't leave them unaddressed and um, please don't poo-poo the idea of addressing food and lifestyle first because sometimes that is the best answer for everything. So, What are the symptoms to watch out for? Um, so depending on if you've got overactive or underactive thyroid, so hypo, hypo or hyper, um, it can range from um, the, the overactive being kind of too much stimulation. So that would be uh, racing heartbeats, uh, difficulty sleeping. Um, you can get all of the, the hair loss. You can literally be taking out clumps of hair. Um, other hormone imbalances, um, joint pain is a common one. Um, and underactive would be kind of that real fatigue, sluggishness, um, weight gain, um, as opposed to obviously overactive, which is weight loss usually. Um, and yeah, skin, hair and nails is a big one. Gut issues. There are, there are many, many, many symptoms that go along with thyroid conditions. Sometimes the weird and wonderful ones come out. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so so don't dismiss anything, I don't think. Uh, what about the fertility thing? Because you did mention yeah. the cycles. Yes, so fertility issues are huge um, for both hypo or hyper. When the thyroid isn't functioning as it should, it hugely it interacts so hugely with our sex hormones so you can see things ranging from just irregular menstrual cycles all the way to infertility and difficulty conceiving or you know not being able to see pregnancies to full term which is heartbreaking and um you know incredibly difficult for for women that are dealing with that so 
yeah that's a that's a huge symptom um but that's that's something else that I wanted to mention is that you know I wanted to talk a little bit about why men and women have to tackle the food and lifestyle thing quite differently men can kind of aggressively work out do the fasting maybe looking look at doing OMADs and not really worry too much about being in ketosis for as long you know that men have the the hormone set up to be (laughs) quite forgiving of all of those things whereas women really really need to optimize um eating you know carnivore and lifestyle for their cycle so that's something else that again is great for for thyroid and balancing um sort of that that cascade of hormones that comes from your thyroid as well as your sex hormones um but it also stops that confusion between should i be high fat and should i be high protein well let's look at how you go sort of high fat high protein all throughout your menstrual cycle um and just really get those hormones working for you wow that was a fabulous interview i hope you enjoyed that and if you like that sort of thing i recommend you watch this one next